When last we left our intrepid adventurers, in the back of the building there is a crack in the ground large enough for a person to crawl into. Akai goes first, followed by Seraph, then Scala and Keberdane. Morgan lights the end of her staff, and Ulysses follows her, and Marcus brings up the rear, despite protesting that he really should be in front. The fissure goes deeper and deeper, and the floor becomes an underground stream. By following the water down the tunnel, the party is able to find their way deeper into the catacombs. The party continues down, deeper and deeper. Scala winces. Her foot doesn't seem to have healed fully. Akai mentions that maybe she should stay off of it for a while. Scala gives her an annoyed look. At this point, everyone is drenched to the bone and the cold water is making them shiver. Keberdine wonders out loud if this passageway leads to the mythical land of Nushub Malor. Morgan tells him to save the story for later. The floor goes up and there's an incline and the party now is mostly out of the water, but the gray dirt turns into a slippery mud which makes their passing harder. Further down the corridor, they're on dry land again. There is a moaning coming from ahead of them. Marcus chalks it up to some wind blowing into the cavern from outside. Ahead they find a large cavern that is lit by a glowing blue fungus on the ceiling. The party cannot see all the way across the room. There seem to be trees in their path. As they get closer and closer to the trees, they see that they're actually statues of people. There is a roar, and a herd of bull-like beasts come charging in. The creatures are covered in steel plates, and there's a strange smell to the steam that comes out of their noses and mouths. Keberdain yells for everyone to not breathe the mixture. But it's too late for Ulysses and Seraph. They've turned to statues where they stood. Most of the weapons the party have seem to just glance off the beast's hides, and only lucky shots seem to be able to bring the creatures down. After the battle, the party does the best healing that they can before they turn their attention to Ulysses and Seraph. Keberdane rummages through his bags muttering about something that might do the trick. He pulls out a scroll and reads it over the two men. There's a faint glow between them, and they become flesh again. Keberdane quips that he thought he would never have need for that scroll. The party dusts themselves off from the fight and decides to hold up in the room to get their spells back for what they believe is the final push. They ward the entrance, but then they're woken up by two more of the creatures that come wandering in. They make the party rethink their sleeping accommodations, if they're going to be constantly bothered by wandering monsters. But the rest of the night is uneventful. The next morning, Scala tells Morgan that she's decided to spend some of her time studying for the priesthood of Chaldasea in order to become an Andern in the Chaldite religion. Morgan and Marcus are happy and they kid her that they'll get to boss her around since she'll be a Novit for a while. They begin to move further down the corridor. They come across strands of web-like material clinging to the walls. The material is obviously some kind of spider silk, but it glows with an otherworldly light. Indeed, up ahead, the walls and such are completely covered with webs, leaving a single file tunnel through the area. Led by Marcus, they find a room beyond the webs. Marcus sees dark shapes in it and prepares for combat. When the light is brought up, he sees that the shapes were piles of discarded clothing. Beyond that room is a gate-like device covered with flapping strips of what appear to be flayed flesh. 
While the rest of the adventurers are discussing the possible gate they found, Ulysses is playing around with the devices of torture in the chamber. He comes to the conclusion that these devices are special in that they are designed so that a person can torture themselves rather than others. He admires the workmanship and tells the rest of the party what he's found. Additionally, he finds rolls of human flesh that have been torn by the devices and then thrown away in a bucket. The party agrees that they should go through the gate. As each character goes through the gate, they are battered and bruised by the energies of the device. They end up in a huge cavern filled with scores of naked, mutilated bodies in it. In the center of the cavern is a large hole which the wind is whistling out of. Hanging above the hole is a large milk-white stone. The rock is sweating a viscous liquid down into the pit. Scala uses a spell to look into the pit, but doesn't see anything, so the party continues to explore the room. Off to one side are two pools of water. They also have dripping stones above them. Looking into the pools, they see that they are in fact windows like panes of glass beyond which the characters see shadows flit by. In the smaller of the two windows, a demonic face stares back at them and grimaces. Morgan, Scala, and Seraph are searching the rest of the room, and they uncover a trio of statues on the far wall. After a detailed inspection, Morgan says, that she thinks that these are representations of the three main evil gods on Mapur. The god Yelluxemeth, the thing that breathes the night air, Smigoth, the prince of leaves, and Snargasi, the bear. Morgan tells the party that from her readings of the Chaldite holy book, the Book of Deeds, she knows the story of how Yelluxemeth escaped from a place before the barrier. When he got to the prime plane, he gave forth the other two gods. The party decides that somehow these pools are gates to the time before the barrier. As a large drop of water hits the smaller of the two window pools, the statue of Snargasi comes to life and summons things out of the smaller pool. The creatures jump out of the pool and attack the party. After a brief struggle, the party decides that they need to get away from the pool so they can plan. They decide to destroy the smaller of the dripping rock formations. A quick spell destroys the rock, and a huge torrent of water suddenly falls out of it and into the pool, releasing three more of the creatures. Morgan manages to banish one of them, while Scala attacks the other with her spells, the third goes down after Marcus puts his holy blade to the creature. The group decide that they cannot destroy the pools, so they block the entrance as best they can, and they go out through the gate they came in from. Once out, Scala and Keberdane start to set wards on the gate. The gate begins to activate again, as if something wants to come through it. Finishing the wards, the party steps out of the room, and Keberdane and Scala, along with the help of Morgan, direct spells towards the roof of the room. The roof collapses and seals the room, hopefully, forever. The party makes their way back up through the dungeon without incident. Upon returning to the surface, they meet Lanmere. They've decided that it wasn't something taking individuals. Rather, it was beckoning evil folk who were being summoned to the place, and their souls were being used for something, possibly trying to break down the barrier. The party trusts in the runes and wards placed on the exit, 
as well as tons of stone that the gate is under to keep it in check. Keberdain says that when he gets a chance, he will report the place to his guild brothers to see if anything more permanent can be done to block the tunnel. Landmere rewards them with some gold and inquiries about where they're heading next. The party says that they intend to stick to the original plan of going to Modem or Kodai via Red Jack. Landmere asks them to look into the arrest of one of the local brigand leaders, a young man called Alcine. He wants to know if it's true that he's been arrested. Landmere describes Alcine as a sort of Robin Hood type character. The characters say that they'll look into it if they have time. Landmere leads the party high up into the mountains. They find a flat outcropping made of a blue gold stone. Landmere tells them that this is the place called Sleep's Furrowed Brow. He offers them some pillows and blankets and says that they will dream of the past, the present, or the future. Which? asks Sakai. Landmere shrugs. That isn't known until you sleep and dream. Morgan, Seraph, Akai, Scala, and Marcus decide to sleep on the outcroppings while Ulysses and Keberdane stand watch. They lay down and close their eyes, and slowly they start to fall asleep.